I know that this is a topic that uh, raises a lot of strong emotions as well as a lot, a lot of strong data points. And so I'm going to try to talk through both kind of where we know things, where there are a lot of spaces that we don't know things, and where I see the field going in the years to come, ways that I hope that many of you can help contribute um, over the next decades um, to what will doubtless uh, continue um, to be a problem here in the United States. So um, as an academic, I of course have my disclosures. I do have NIH and CDC research support for some of the work I'll be talking about today. Um, I serve uh, in a volunteer capacity um, on two boards for two different nonprofits related to the work that I'll be talking about today, but have no uh, personal financial conflicts. So learning objectives today are first to be able to describe the basic epidemiology of firearm injury in the United States. Second, to be able to analyze the limitations and opportunities in the data sources and the data that we have available. And then the third is to be able to identify three individual neighborhood and societal drivers of firearm injury. And for those of you like me who are interventionists at heart, um, to also be able to think about how the emerging evidence is showing us ways to help um, turn those drivers of injury into protective factors to help change the pathway before folks end up hurt. So I'm gonna start um, with a, a little bit of the why. Um, for why I do this work, um, why I care so deeply about uh, firearm injury and firearm injury as a public health problem in the face of so many other public health problems that we're facing, um, and, and how I came into working on this as uh, a public health problem that we can solve through science. Um, so I have worked in the area of violence prevention. Actually, Corey Peak Asa, um, your vice chancellor for research, uh, was an early a remote mentor of mine um, in the world of injury prevention. Um, so have been working in violence prevention since long before um, I, I honestly went to college or med school or got my um, public health degree. Um, but had always thought of violence as kind of being around gender-based violence and sexual assault and hadn't actually spent a lot of time thinking about um, firearm injury in particular as in the same vein as I thought about the other types of violence that I worked in. And that started to shift for me um, about 15 years ago. Um, I was a relatively new attending emergency physician. I was working in the emergency department on a warm July night, much like tonight. Uh, I'll be heading to the ED after I, I give this talk actually tonight. So it was, it felt almost exactly the same. It was a hot evening. We knew that um, the evening was going to be full of community violence. Um, that was just part of our bread and butter of emergency medicine. Um, and lo and behold, we got a call from EMS um, that they were coming in with a young male with a GSW or gunshot wound. Now, this being early July, our whole medical team had just turned over. Residents kind of move up a level. Med students get into the clinical sphere for the first time. Um, and so there was a lot of excitement almost in the room because people think of gunshot wounds as being part of what we do in emergency medicine. And for many folks, this was going to be the first time they were going to get to be part of the resuscitation um, of someone who had been shot. Sounds morbid, but, but true. So we had med students and social workers and radiology techs and our trauma surgeons. And I was there as the, the head of um, the emergency medicine team. Um, and we're all kind of prepping the room, ready for what's going to come in. And then EMS pulls up. Rhode Island is a pretty small state, so it doesn't take a long time for, for EMS to get there. And they walk in, which is never a good sign. Um, and they walk into the room and the room goes quiet. Um, and it went quiet because it was not at all what we were expecting. It was not um, a young man who had been shot through uh, or because of an argument or um, in an episode of community violence but rather it was a young man who had shot himself um, in the head. And as the story turned out, um, he had had a kind of emotional thing happen that day, um, knew where his father's firearm was, knew how to access it, and had gotten a hold of that and, and used that to what to do what ultimately killed him. We were, we were on a, the wound was very clearly non-survivable. Um, this was the first time that I had ever seen a firearm suicide in the emergency department. We see a lot of suicide attempts every day. It's 
also unfortunately part of the bread and butter of our practice, um, but almost all of them are able to be saved and live. Um, this young man at, at this point um, was one of only a handful of folks um, who I had lost after a suicide attempt. And so as the room went quiet and as I looked at him and then as I started to process this afterwards, one of the first things that I started asking was, why was this different? Um, and as I'll talk about, I started looking into firearm suicide and the actual prevalence and, and why firearms are so much more lethal. And I started to think about, you know, what, how could we change suicide rates if, if we change access to a firearm? The second thing about this event that stuck with me and that shifted my perspective and made me start thinking about firearm injury as a public health problem was honestly part of the reason that the room went silent was because this young man was white. And so were most of the people in the room who were there as treating physicians or social workers or kind of whatever their role was. And usually, right, usually the young men who come in who are shot are minorities, are black or Hispanic. Um, and this case stuck with me for that reason and made me start thinking about the elements of structural racism in our response to firearm injury and our willingness to call it a public health problem and in trying to look at why it is that young black and brown men are at such higher risk of being shot by someone else than young white men. Why this was such an anomaly and how wrong it was that we responded so differently. Um, so that was the second part of this story that you will hear kind of make its way through um, as I talk. And the third thing about it was, again, the fact that at that point I had already done a fellowship in injury prevention. So I'd been trained in this whole science of how we can prevent injury, uh, how there are multiple strategies that we've used over and over to decrease the likelihood of the human body being exposed to something that can cause injury. And I started to ask myself why, I start, as I started to look into the literature, I found that there was virtually nothing on firearm injury prevention, and I started to ask why that was. And it, as I started to kind of do a little research, the answer bothered me. And the answer for why there was virtually no data on firearm injury as, as a public health problem is because of the guy on the left side of this slide. Um, so in 1996, a junior representative from Arkansas, a man named Jay Dickey, um, passed the now infamous Dickey Amendment um, he created this in response to a paper that had been done um, by Art Kellerman, another father of injury prevention, a former chair of emergency medicine at Emory. He'd written it with a group of other folks, showing that if you have a firearm in the home, you're more likely to die of a firearm injury. Now this to me, to any of us who do public health, know that this is just kind of the most basic of studies, right? It's If you have a pool in the home, you're more likely to have your kids, unfortunately, have a near drowning or drowning. If you have a car, you're more likely to be in a car crash, right? This is just a very clear kind of uh, statement of association. But uh, when this study was published, some political advocacy groups um, took it as a statement of um, intention to try to um, limit access to firearms. And so turned it into an advocacy moment, worked with Jay Dickey to create this Dickey Amendment, which by the way, did not ban the CDC from spending money on firearm injury prevention. What the Dickey Amendment did say was that the CDC was prohibited from using federal funding to promote or advocate for gun control or for gun firearm policy, which the CDC can't do anyways. But when the Dickey Amendment was passed, all the money that the CDC had been spending on firearm injury prevention was taken away from them in a very clear signal that this type of research and, and um, implementation would not be tolerated and from 1996 up until, as I'll talk about, up until 2020, the CDC got zero dollars in appropriations for firearm injury prevention research. Um, the same kind of amendment or, or action was taken against NIH relatively soon thereafter. And so Jay Dickey's story is part of my trajectory um, and is part of the reason there's not a lot of literature out there. Because at the point when I entered the field of injury prevention, this was still a very fresh thing that had happened. And so as I started looking into firearms as a public health problem, I was told over and over again by mentors, Megan, be careful. You can't do research on firearms. It is a political third rail. It is a no-go. You will never develop uh, a federally funded career, a career in federally funded research. Find ways to follow this if this is something that is interesting to you, but don't kind of use the word gun in your applications for grants 
in your papers, be very, very cautious. Now, a few of you on this call know me. I am not someone who takes no easily. Um, and so I took that to heart and I said, let me think about it and try to find ways around it. So I started trying to work with some of my mentors to find some data and to do little bits of work. And then, of course, um, the middle is the picture of um, the victims um, of the Sandy Hook shooting. And I think that that galvanized many of us across the country. Um, it was such a moment of horror and hopelessness, um, right? We had this moment of things are gonna change and then realized that actually nothing was gonna change. And so that was a moment where I went from trying to do this work kind of in the background to saying I actually had an obligation to be very, very clear and vocal about the fact that firearm injury is a public health problem and that we have a science of injury prevention that can address it. And started to work with folks, um, Garen Wintemute, who's out at UC Davis, took me under his wing, which I'm forever grateful for. I found other colleagues across the country, actually became friends with some of the folks that were um, first responders at, at Sandy Hook and parents um, who lost their children. Um, and that has become part of my story and part of my why. And then the third picture on the right, and then I'll stop with the personal stuff and go into the meat of it. But I think it's important because so many of us that do this work um, have this kind of very personal grounding. Um, the, the picture on the right is of a fellow emergency physician, Dr. Tamara O'Neill, um, who was shot and killed by her ex-fiance as she left an emergency department shift in November of 2018. Uh, he knew her schedule, met her as she was leaving the emergency department, shot her, and then also killed a police officer and a pharmacist. And her story motivates me as well because it reminds me first that this is personal for so many of us. Um, almost every American has a personal or kind of one hand removed story about having lost someone to firearm injury, that none of us are immune um, and, and I carry her story and, and, uh, I'm, you know, friends with her best friends and I've become friends with her family as well, um, as one of the reasons that we can't ever stop doing this work. Um, but also, uh, Tamara would not want to be remembered for the way that she died, but rather for the way that she lived, which was ad advocating for equity and change. And so I do this work in her memory as well. So with that as preamble, go into kind of the, the epi and the data. So the kind of underlying thesis behind all that I'm gonna talk about for the next 45 minutes or so is that firearm injury is not just a public health problem, but it's an epidemic. And pre-COVID, when I would say that, people who are not in public health would say, what is an epidemic? And so I think it's worth saying out loud why I think that public health, firearm injury meets the definition of an epidemic. It's because the CDC's official definition is the occurrence of more cases of disease than expected in a given area or among a specific group of people over a particular period of time. And as we will see over the next few minutes, although it is distributed across the United States, it is certainly concentrated among certain groups and the numbers are going up year after year. Um, I'm gonna acknowledge that what we all experience the fear of, and part of the reason that I'm here giving this talk today is because of mass shootings. Um, I am a mom of two. I, they're getting older, um, but I still put them on the bus every morning uh, during the school year and kind of say that little uh, internal prayer that nothing will happen that day. And this is a really real and valid fear uh, in this country, sadly, and now it's not just schools, right? But parades and yoga classes and churches and name the place. Um, th there is a level of fear uh, which should not be tolerated. But the reality is, is that mass shootings are just the littlest drop in the bucket or the very, very tip of our injury prevention pyramid. Um, the reality is, is that across the United States, more than 100 people are killed and more than 200 are injured every single day. 60% of those deaths are suicide related, um, which is an important kind of part of just contextualizing the fear of mass shootings. When we think about epidemics, we of course, again, think about where it concentrates. Many folks default to thinking, if not about mass shootings, then to thinking about um, gang violence. Um, people associate uh, gun violence with cities like Chicago or St. Louis. Um, but if you actually look at which states have the highest death rates, we find that rural areas are just as likely, if not more so, to have high rates of gun death. And that's largely because of gun suicide, right? Um, but the states with, a, as of um, 
last year, um, the states with the highest age-adjusted gun death rates were Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Montana, um, Wyoming, and Missouri. Um, there are cities that have dramatically higher death rates like um, St. Louis City, um, but overall, kind of when we think about this epidemic, it's recognizing that there are states with higher death rates than others. And then it's an epidemic because, as I mentioned already, we do all know someone who's affected. There is nothing about being alive in the United States that protects you. Um, young minority men are disproportionately affected, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but there are other groups that are disproportionately affected as well. The military, our healthcare professions, our disproportionate law enforcement officers are disproportionately more likely to die of firearm suicide um, than the average American. Um, children, firearm injury is the leading cause of death now for ch American children age one through 19. Um, there's, there's really not a population in the US that doesn't get touched. So let me go into some more specific data points now. To orient you, we have age group in five-year increments along the x-axis and absolute numbers of deaths along the y-axis in increments of 1,000. So this is the pattern of deaths um, by age among men in the United States. You see a peak um, in those kind of young adult uh, years and then a plateau up through middle age. And this is the pattern of deaths uh, for women. And you see that for women, we kind of, again, our, our gun death rates start to rise at around age, kind of just as we get into our teenage years, but then stay pretty flat throughout our entire life. Um, I'll say that for women, most gun deaths are uh, intimate partner violence related um, and stay stable throughout our life. Uh, intimate partner homicide is the most common reason for homicide death among women and firearm related intimate partner homicide is the most common reason for both firearm death and for homicide death among women. That's as much as I'll say about kind of the epi of um, gun deaths for women in the US. Let me now go into a little more detail around the patterns among men. Again, I have age on the x-axis, absolute numbers um, along the y-axis, and this is using 2020 data, which is the last full year of data that we have available from um, the CDC. Uh, so this is patterns of death among non-Hispanic white males. You see, again, that peak in young adult years that doesn't actually let up, but stays pretty stable right up through um, the late, kind of mid to late 60s. These are the patterns among non-Hispanic black males and then Hispanic males. And the takeaway here um, is that firearm injury uh, disproportionately affects young black and brown men. However, for and, and firearm death disproportionately affects young black and brown men. But over the entire life cycle, um, white men are at high risk. And I put this up not to downplay, the, again, that effect of structural and environmental racism, but rather, again, to point out that everyone is at risk. I find that when I talk about firearm injury on a national basis, that there's this sense that it's a problem that happens to quote unquote, other people, right? If I'm speaking in uh, areas that are rural or are primarily white. And I make the point that there is no one in this country who escapes the risk of firearm death. And lastly, as we talk about epidemics, um, I mentioned already that rates are increasing, but just to put it in kind of clear uh, visual form, here we have an x-axis of years, y-axis is rates um, per 100K, so adjusted for population. Um, you can see that our firearm suicide death rate has been increasing inexorably since about 2005, 2006. Our firearm homicide death rate, um, if I track this back further, um, it was quite high in the 80s and early 90s. From the 90s to, to through most of the 2000s, it was pretty low and then started to go up around 2013, 2014, and obviously increased dramatically during the pandemic. Um, there's some preliminary data suggesting that firearm homicide has decreased this year compared to last year, but we're still waiting um, on final rates. Regardless, overall, the rate of death from firearms in the United States is increasing and has been for about a decade. And if I look in a little more detail at the type of death, um, as an injury prevention specialist, right, the intentionality matters deeply. We had about 45,000 total gun deaths in the United States in 2020. Of those, about 1.4% were legal interventions. I'll talk about that in a second. About 1.2% were unintentional. About 1% were of undetermined intent. About 43% were homicide. And about 53% in 2020 were suicide. On an average year, two thirds of gun deaths are suicide. But again, last year was atypical um, in terms of the number of gun homicides. One caveat to make here is that we actually know that 
even these very simple stats about what was the intentionality behind the gun death are up for a little bit of debate. Um, there have been reports um, by some intrepid researchers uh, looking at intentionality, showing that there are some biases in how intentionality is coded according to race. Um, as many of us know who work in um, injury, uh, many states or, or counties have coroners who are elected rather than um, trained medical examiners. And so there's um, a lot of area for um, uh, kind of opinion in, in how a death gets coded. And so the number of unintentional versus suicide versus homicide injuries may not actually be completely accurate. This becomes particularly important when you look at those law enforcement involved shootings. Um, this is an area where there was virtually no research for a very long time. There's now a growing but still very small body of research. Um, and there was a paper published um, just uh, last year that looked at adjusting reported counts um, of police-related shooting, fatal shootings um, using other data sources and found, not surprisingly, that what's reported um, through existing data sources is off. Um, compared to if you actually go using media reports and, and other sources of data. Um, and so I created a model that adjusted, um, and I can talk more about it in Q&A, um, that actually created a, a better estimate of the number of um, law enforcement involved deaths year by year. They then go into kind of by race, ethnicity, or, um, urban location, et cetera, um, which is a, a growing area of work. I'll also acknowledge um, that I've talked a lot about deaths and not so much about injury, and there's a really good reason for that. Um, the CDC has pulled uh, firearm injury data out of whiskers um, because the National Electronic Injury Surveillance System that they use uh, that takes a sample of uh, injuries from emergency departments around the country um, and then adjusts it to present national um, estimates of injury rates has been shown to be quite biased for firearm injury. So we actually don't have an accurate count of the number of injuries that happen across the United States, which as a public health professional is astounding, right? I can't even tell you on accurately how many people are hurt but not killed. Um, never mind getting into things like some of the um, uh, things that we care about that often get discussed in the policy sphere, like so-called defensive gun use. There's absolutely no way to count something like that. Um, currently, there are zero good data sources um, as to whether or not it happens, how often, how often it results in a shooting, et cetera. Um, so this was a nice paper that came out of some colleagues at Penn um, looking at uh, injury rates according to age and intentionality They all and um, by urban versus rural. Um, again, there are those caveats around the way that injury is coded, um, but starts to be able to give us some estimates of non-fatal injuries, which again, when you look at that injury pyramid, we know that usually for every one death, there's you know 10 to 100 injuries, um, and then many more that present to an emergency department, many more that don't. Um, and, and we just don't have a sense of quite how big that pyramid is um, for firearms. It's a great area of research for those of you that are interested. And as I talk about data sources, some of the places that many of us are starting to look is, of course, um, you know, I mentioned NICE, um, but there are other so federal databases as well. Essence, which many of you may work with for biosurveillance of, um, of infectious disease epidemics, they're actually starting to collect injury data. The National Violent Death Reporting System, which is an amazing initiative of the CDC, collects really nice data in a much more specific way about the antecedents um, to a violent death, suicide or homicide, and they actually include all firearm deaths in here. Um, but there's a huge lag between when the death happens and when the data becomes available. And then NEDS, or the Nationwide ED sample. There's also nonprofit research um, centers, such as the Gun Violence Archive, which is a citizen science initiative, tracks media reports of shootings, does not cover firearm suicide and does not include demographic data, but a, a good kind of count, um, better than what we have for injuries um, in other sources. And then there are some nice local data sources. Um, Philly in particular has some great sources created through partnerships between police and hospitals and the city. And there is hospital data with an increasing number of folks across the country that are using hospital data and joining it with EMS data or other sources. So progress to be made on data, but really what I just presented is about the extent of what we know about EPI. Um, stuff on preventive factors, risk factors, we found largely through cohort studies, really tough to determine from the existing data sources.
The final piece of data, of course, that I haven't mentioned yet is around guns and gun ownership. Um, current data suggests that there's around 400 million guns in private hands in the United States, around 120 million people who own firearms. So most people who own a firearm own one. There are a few people who own many more. Um, there are around 30-ish, somewhere between 25 and 35 million uh, AR-15s or equivalents in private hands in the United States. Again, and there are 40,000 gun deaths. Far too many, but and from a public health perspective, I think it's point, worth pointing out that it's not necessarily, again, a one-to-one -one correlation between gun ownership and gun death. Yes, having a gun in the home increases your risk of gun death, but there are some places that have higher than expected rates of gun death given the rate of gun ownership and there are some places that have lower than expected gun deaths given the rate of gun ownership. This is a paper that came out just a few weeks ago, kind of showing hot spots versus low spots, high outliers versus low outliers on a county basis. I mention this um, because I think it's really, really important for us as a field to take a deep look at what those things are that make some counties have higher than expected rates and some counties have lower than expected rates. And if you look at this, the high county outliers are again, not necessarily the urban areas. So what are those protective factors? What are those risk factors that can give a path forward for us for how to better reduce the risk of injury and death, given the fact that there are 400 million firearms out there? That's the data part and the epi. Now let me move into kind of what we do about it. So public health approach to firearm injury, I don't have to tell all of you, right? We have four basic steps, gather data, identify risk and protective factors, develop and evaluate interventions, and then implement what works. As I've already outlined, gathering data and identifying risk and protective factors is something that is very insufficient for this field. Our development and evaluation of interventions is also in its infancy. And unfortunately, much of what we're implementing is based off of gut instinct rather than based off of data. And we only have to look at the history of public health to know how poorly that goes. We've had many, many programs over the years that we thought were gonna be great and ended up not helping or actually making things worse on a large sphere in public health. And then you can imagine the same thing is true for the specific area of firearm injury prevention. I do think it's worth, even though I know that you are a public health audience, I frequently get questions of Megan, but firearms are different. Um, and, and I wanna make this really important point, which is that when we apply this approach, even with the fact that we have 400 million firearms in private hands in the United States, we can create change. And here's why. So you look at car crash deaths, right? This, the field of injury prevention was founded on this, but we've decreased car crash deaths across the United States by around 70%, depending on how you count it, since the late 60s, early 70s. We have done that not by taking cars off the road. Rather, there are more cars on the road, more millions of miles traveled per person than ever before in the history of the United States. We've done it by applying this basic public health approach, putting in place engineering solutions, putting in place economic incentives for safe driving, and doing education around things like drunk driving or putting your kid in a car seat, right? So we have managed to make driving a car safer, we've made cars safer, roads safer, policies safer, and the drivers themselves safer without limiting fire, or excuse me, without limiting car ownership for the majority of Americans, but there are certainly regulations around it. We've done that by applying the public health approach. Same thing for HIV AIDS, right? Which is a very different type of problem from the injury problem I was talking about. But I remember most many of you on this call probably do as well when HIV was discovered. We saw this dramatic rise um, in, in uh, both infections and deaths in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, I'll say my uncle, who is, uh, helped run Art Power at UCSD, um, cut his teeth working for ACT UP um, in the, or kind of volunteering for ACT UP in the late 80s, um, advocating for uh, quick development of, of medications and access to them. Um, in some ways similar to our COVID stories now. Well, we've decreased the HIV AIDS death rate by more than 90%, um, not, right, by banning sex or banning drugs. And in fact, we know that that abstinence-only approach does not work and actually results in outbreaks and worsening um, rates of death. Um, instead, we have used science. We've developed those highly active antiretroviral drugs, um, which you can take either after you get infected or beforehand to prevent it. 
but we've also used education and a harm reduction approach where we know that humans are going to do human things. And so then how do we reduce the risk of infection given that some people are going to be using substances? Some people, are, many of us um, are, are having sex. And so how do you make sex as safe as possible and reduce that risk of transmission? And how do you do that in a community specific way? How do we engage communities to believe in and be able to practice safe practices in, in a way that reduces risk of transmission. Now compare that to the red line, which is firearms. As I'd mentioned earlier, we saw higher death rates in the 80s and 90s that dropped, but then are rising again, where our, our death rate as of last year was close to um, our country's highest ever level. Hopefully this year will be a little lower. Um, but I would argue that a big part of the reason why our firearm death rates are, are increasing is because we have not applied this basic public health approach, which is not about labeling or judging, but rather about using data, again, identifying risk and protective factors, and then developing and implementing interventions that actually work. Now, the lack of our applying that is not for lack of desire. I can, this is just a short number of a huge um, slew of uh, agendas for action, research agendas um, that have been published um, over the last uh, five to 10 years. I actually accidentally cut off. There's a two agendas from the National Academy of Medicine as well. Um, so you guys, I'm happy to share those if you're interested. Um, but it is, I would say it's not the lack of agenda, but a big part of it is the lack of funding. And any of us that are federally funded researchers know that it's really tough to do high quality research if you're doing it on a shoestring budget. And most of the work that I did on firearm injury for the first 15 years of my doing this work was done for free, or maybe with like a very small foundation grant. Um, and there was actually a nice publication in JAMA in 2017. I then co-authored a similar publication um, in Health Affairs in 2019, um, looking at uh, overall funding for firearm injury prevention research. And then the one in Health Affairs was looking specifically for pediatric and adolescent firearm injury prevention research compared to the mortality burden and compared to the funding for other diseases. This paper from JAMA, um, basically it's a, these um, X and Y axes are on a, a logistic scale. Um, they did a linear regression and showed that for the vast majority of diseases or injuries, um, the amount of funding is approximately proportionate to the mortality burden. Gun violence kind of falls off that cliff. Falls do as well, which we could talk about separately in another talk. So this, I found unacceptable, and so I and others kind of agitated for quite a while to try to change um, this uh, problem with funding. Um, we led a This Is Our Lane campaign on Twitter in response to a very poorly worded and poorly timed NRA tweet um, in November of 2018, um, and happy to talk more about that during Q&A. But it eventually, thanks in part to the This Is Our Lane campaign, as well as to the sustained work of many, many, many groups across the United States um, finally uh, got uh, funding released or appropriated to the CDC and to the NIH for the first time in more than 20 years, um, starting in 2020. So it was $25 million in 2020, same in 2021. We'll see what we get this coming year, um, which is amazing. And I'm honored to have gotten one of that first tranche of CDC R01s. But I also want to point out, if I go back to that prior slide, it is a drop in the bucket. We need billions in order to make up for the 24 uh, years of no research. And we've got 25 million a year split between NIH and CDC. So better than nothing, but still far from sufficient. Okay, so now on to the last part of my talk, which will be the shortest so that we do have time for Q&A, um, which is a little bit about kind of where the field is going talked about data. I've talked about the public health approach. So what are people starting to look at? Where are there places where I see hope? So one is around um, healthcare provider interactions. And you living in California, your state has been tremendously forward thinking. This is a program based out of UC Davis called Bullet Points, um, which is funded through the California Wellness Foundation, as well as now through the legislature, um, to develop um, programs that help teach healthcare providers how to have these harm reduction conversations with patients in a way that's non-judgmental and effective. Hopefully they're gonna be able to study it soon. Right now it's just mostly been developed based off of expert consensus. There are other projects such as the Violence Project, um, which is a lovely, um, really smartly done database um, of mass shooters on a na national basis, um, looking at uh, how do we identify folks who are highest risk of committing one of these horrific acts of violence um, and 
contrary to popular sentiment, um, it's not all about mental health, right? So there is some aspect of mental illness in here, um, slightly more than average had a history of mental health problems, but really the biggest predictor is a prior history of violence. Um, the other big thing is that 80% of the folks um, who did um, commit one of these horrific crimes was experiencing an acute crisis. And the last thing that I'll say, kind of just from a data perspective, I'm not making a political point, but eight, almost 80% of these shoot, mass shootings were with a handgun, which I think is just important for us to know the facts um, as we get into a very heated political climate. So a nice example of where research is going, they need more funding, there's much more work to do. One of my dreams, if I had a magic wand, is that we would create um, a nice predictive rule that allowed us to be both sensitive and specific as to who's highest risk um, for, for these types of mass um, violence, but we're far from that at this point, thanks to the state of the science and the state of the data. Another example of a beautiful and promising program um, are hospital and community-based violence intervention programs. Um, as I'd mentioned, I am uh, on the board of our local violence intervention program here in Rhode Island. Um, this is one of my mentees, Kristen Mueller at Wash U, um, works with the Life Outside of Violence group, um, which works across all the St. Louis hospitals has really promising preliminary stats around the folks that are enrolled in the program. They offer comprehensive wraparound services for mental health, education, legal assistance, and so on, and have decreased the rate of recurrent firearm injury among these very, very, very high-risk youth. Um, address and are, are also increasingly working to address some of the structural drivers as well. But it's promising. It's not proven yet. And I think that's a really important thing to say around hospital-based violence intervention programs, especially as we see the current administration appropriately putting money into them. We need more data and more study. Other examples. Um, this is from a dear friend of mine, Emmy Betts, um, who is at University of Colorado. I was honored to be on her grant, Lock to Live, where we developed a web-based decision aid to help people who were suicidal and who had access to a firearm to walk themselves through how to more safely store their firearm until they were doing better. This is important because healthcare providers don't have time or the skill set. We know that lethal means counseling works, but it's not applied in practice. So we developed this web-based decision aid, which is undergoing further study um, and is actually currently being studied um, at UCLA with teens as well. Um, and these also developed some national gun storage maps um, to allow folks who are gun owners to identify a place where they can safely store their firearm temporarily, either until they're through an acute crisis or until something else changes. You know, maybe they have grandkids coming to visit and they don't have a safe in their house. So where do you put it safely where you don't have to worry that it's gonna be taken away from you forever? So a nice example of kind of that community partnership um, with the goal of increasing risk factors, or excuse me, decreasing risk factors and increasing protective factors. My own work, as Camille mentioned, is largely around how do we use technology to break the risk or to kind of decouple risk from actual injury. Um, I've done a lot of work with text messaging, Instagram, social media monitoring and intervention and other programs um, to uh, help youth who are at particularly high risk of physical violence and firearm injury to increase conflict resolution skills, improve emotional resilience, improve bystander interventions, and so on. And our data so far, our preliminary and pilot data, is quite promising. We're in the middle of a bunch of big studies. Um, but like everything in firearm injury, it's all still kind of in this pilot level, right? Another project that I'm proud to work on is that CDC grant. Um, we're partnering with 4-H Shooting Sports. Um, for those of you that are familiar with 4-H, it is a national um, leadership program for youth across the United States incredibly powerful um, in terms of kids that participate in 4-H in general, have better educational outcomes, um, better health, um, better career outcomes, and lower injury rates than youth that do not participate in 4-H in their communities. Shooting Sports is a program that's offered to, depending on the year, somewhere between 200 and 500,000 youth aged 8 through 17 across the United States. It's for kids that grow up in communities where firearm ownership is common, Hunting and fishing is common, right? It teaches them the basics of safe firearm handling and teaches them a lot about unintentional injury prevention, but it doesn't teach anything about intentional firearm injury prevention. So we're working with them to train them in a bystander intervention program to help them recognize risk and intervene long before an injury happens. So things like, you know, 
They have a friend who's involved in a dating violence situation or who's showing signs of being depressed. What are the steps that you can take to help reduce that risk? Stay tuned for results. I work on the nonprofit level. Um, I mentioned Affirm, which is a nonprofit that I helped co-found um, with Chris Barsati, an emergency physician in um, Vermont. We're now based at the Aspen Institute, dedicated to creating um, nonpartisan conversations around the public health approach to firearm injury, really trying to bring together firearm owning communities and public health professionals, which are sometimes the same. 40% of Americans have a firearm in the home, um, but trying to kind of take that conversation to the next level. Um, there's some brilliant work going on around structural interventions. If I go back to um, my original why for why I do this work um, and that kind of recognition of the environmental and structural factors that play into our acceptance of firearm injury on a national basis, um, a lot of that is around structural racism. And I have colleagues across the country that are doing great work looking at how we address that. I in particular want to call out the work of Dr. Gina South, who's at Penn, um, who's received a number of grants from NIH and also has some really promising paper or positive effect paper showing actual efficacy already um, done with Charlie Brannis, who's at Columbia, um, looking at uh, when you put um, gardens into vacant lots. So if you take a vacant lot in a city and put a garden in, and randomize neighborhoods to either get their vacant lot, put have a garden put in or not. The neighborhoods that have the vacant lot be greened have lower rates of fire, uh, guns shot, violent injury, depression, stress, et cetera, in the community surrounding where the garden is put in. So such a simple intervention that can have such wide ranging effects. And that's not even counting kind of some of those larger um, salutary effects that we, which we could imagine we'll see. And finally, I would be remiss to not mention policy, which is part of any aspect of public health. I'm happy to answer questions about this. My own work does not focus primarily on policy. Um, interestingly, there is some very strong data that whenever policies are proposed on a national level, rates of firearm ownership skyrocket. Rates of firearm purchasing skyrocket. So although there is strong data behind many policies, there's also some real importance in us being really thoughtful about which policies we propose and how we put them into place. And of course, as any of us who work in public health know, passing a law is not the same as actually seeing it implemented. Um, and so there's some interesting work, for example, around child access prevention laws, which clearly decrease suicide, may decrease unintentional injuries and deaths, but there's a lot of conflation between the law and the culture in the state. And so there's really interesting work going on, looking at kind of how you match policy to changes in social norms and, and changes in enforcement, particularly important, of course, for red flag or extreme risk protection orders. Um, this uh, slide comes off of a great um, summary of policy from Rand, um, a guy named Andrew Morrell. And finally, to close, um, I bring it back to Dr. O'Neill um, and kind of when I think about the interventions that are needed, uh, one of the biggest things is just talking about it and making sure that folks know um, that uh, this can happen to any of us and thinking through ways that we can help create change on behalf of our communities and on behalf of those that so many of us have lost. So to close, simple three takeaways is first, uh, know that, learn the facts. We in public health are really good at that. Unfortunately, the facts are still kind of hazy, <laughs> but there's a lot of work to do there. The second part is around sharing our stories, um, knowing that that contextualization in our community and our lived experience is so much of creating change. And then finally, take action. There is so much to do. Um, and there is a lot of really low hanging fruit. There's also a lot of really, really hard work. Um, that, that we have to do together. But it truly has to be done as all of us. Um, this is not a one side versus the other side um, issue. We will not make progress that way. We never have in the history of public health. And so I would urge you to take action together. So I'll close there with a big thank you. Um, thanks to Camille and to Cheryl for inviting me here today. And I do welcome questions. What a fascinating presentation. Really appreciate learning about this. This is an area that I don't study. So really a nice comprehensive start to this conversation. Um, we have several questions. I, I wanted to start with one that, and, and I'll, I'll go through the, the list in a minute, but you, when you mentioned taking your kids to the bus stop, mm -hmm. 
it just seems like parents are, I don't know, it just seems almost like post-traumatic stress disorder. Yeah. And, and so you have the gun violence, but the impact on society and on parents, is anybody studying that? It's a great question. So we actually did a scoping review a couple of years ago that was published in Journal of, goodness, I think it was Journal of Behavioral Science. I can find it and send it to you, where we looked at all the data around the mental health effects of being exposed to violence. And short version, there's not a lot. There's really not a lot out there. Um, I've worked with Renad Betis, who's at Penn, about to go to Northwestern. She's an implementation scientist and a child and adolescent psychologist um, to try to start to kind of do this work. Um, there's certainly some qual data suggesting um, that it is almost kind of post-traumatic stress for us as parents. Um, there's also some really interesting data. So David Hemingway at Harvard actually looked at youth in Boston, did it through the Boston Youth Survey, um, kids uh, in Boston are likely to overestimate the likelihood that someone else has a firearm and then in response think that they need to own one to protect themselves. So part of the effect that I would actually love to study here is the degree to which these mass shootings actually increase firearm ownership from a sense that you need one to protect yourself. And so we're kind of in this kind of the, whatever the opposite of a virtuous cycle is around kind of each shooting inducing further fear and then further perception that the only way that you can protect yourself is by also owning. And of course, I, we, I didn't even talk about this, but we've had a huge surge in first time firearm owners during the COVID pandemic. Very little of them got basic safety training. Very few of them, you know, there's data that they didn't buy safes or kind of trigger locks or other things that can help keep their firearms safe. So there's long story short, Yes, there's preliminary stuff saying that, that we feel that, but not hard data. Um, I actually did a podcast with Emily Oster just a couple of weeks ago, which I'll encourage those of you who are interested in hearing about that kind of part of the topic to listen to or read. Um, a question about the homicide death rate by firearms is high in states such as Wyoming. Why is that? So it's actually not ho homicide. It's just gun death rates. So rates of deaths from firearms. And so it's actually more suicide than, than homicide in Wyoming. But it's also a great question. We don't know <laughs> to my point of how much we don't know. Um, we really, there's, there's a lot of hypotheses, but not a lot of hard data. Yeah. Okay. Um, curious about intimate partner violence, violence against women as a predictor of gun violence and mass shootings. Is there a relationship there? There is a relationship again. Um, it is a strong relationship, whether it is the strongest predictor is yet to be determined. Um, but we know that it's a strong predictor of women or others dying of um, intimate partner violence. And so one of the policies that actually is most effective is um, strict policies around when someone has either a restraining order or a conviction for domestic violence, getting firearms out of their hands. Um, unfortunately, even in states where those laws are passed, there is that lack of enforcement, which limits the efficacy of those laws. So if you are in a, you know, and, and you look at California, you guys have some of the strictest um, firearm policies in the country, um, but there's still a lot to be done with implementation. Um, another question, really enjoyed this presentation, Dr. Rainey. Full disclosure, I've been a Twitter fan for some time. I'm just starting a collaboration with a community, uh, an anti-violence, a community anti-violence group who okay. engages with gang members. We are hoping to explore and identify opportunities to rebuild trust and communication with law enforcement as a potential means to support gun violence prevention. Any mentors, studies you might suggest that are doing similar work? Yeah, that's great. So there's a whole host of folks in California. You're very lucky to be in the state that you are. Um, uh, Rochelle Dicker, who is at UCLA, um, was one of the early folks to work um, in this field. Uh, there's great work in Sacramento with is it Project Ceasefire. I'm going to forget. My, my brain kind of conflates different. So there's Project Wraparound, Project Ceasefire, um, Caught, at the, Caught in the Crossroads um, are all California-based programs, both community and uh, hospital-based that have shown some promising um, preliminary data. There's a program called Cure Violence, um, which is based out of Chicago, um, which has, again, lovely promising data. And then if you are working with a hospital, there's the, the HAVI, or the Hospitals Against Violence Initiative, which is a collaborative of hospital-based violence intervention programs, um, which is worth joining. There's many reasons we love being in California. 
Um, based on your knowledge of UC San Diego's strengths, how can we contribute to gun violence research? Name the area of public health and there is a need to contribute. So, I mean, it's almost, it, it's almost more difficult for me to say places where you can't contribute. I mean, one of the things about this field is that it is so wide open, whether it's epi, whether it's behavioral and social science and intervention development and implementation, whether it's looking at policy evaluation and implementation, um, or whether it's developing new biostatistical techniques to deal with all of this missingness and um, uh, kind of non-random bias um, in our data sets, there is a need for all of us. Um, I'll say, you know, for environmental health, um, looking at the effect of lead and other environmental pollutants on um, on, on the trajectory of violence, right? So I, I, I really couldn't, um, I can't even begin to say where we can't, where you couldn't make a difference. Um, and I think about this little elementary school down the street from me, and I'm sure that they had good intentions when they labeled their exercise program, Run for Your Life. Oh. But label, you know, even how we frame what we're trying to do to promote health yeah. can, can we, we need to really rethink how we're framing our rhetoric. And I think yeah. that school down the street might be one place that I can maybe start, start a conversation. I love that Camille. I will actually say kind of a related thing for those who are interested in, in that question around language, which I think is so important, um, is, uh, we, Emmy Betts and I, along with a couple of others, wrote a piece in AJPH around the words that we use around firearm injury. So not so much about all the ways that gun imagery is part of our conversation, but rather the words that we use in firearm injury prevention from that harm reduction approach. So I would recommend folks that are interested in, in doing this work to look at that publication. Um, we just have a few more questions in a few more minutes. Are there studies looking at threat assessment programs at schools and effective interventions? This is a wide open field. Um, there's a lot of companies that say that they have great data, but there's not been a lot of rigorous academic assessments. Threat assessments in general are a big part of forensic psych and are, are well established, um, but it's a, it's a big area for potential research, including the trauma that it causes, that some of this causes for teachers. So the, the, if we talk about kind of, act, I mean, we didn't get even into active shooter um, trainings um, and lockdown drills. Yeah, taking the kids to the bus stop and then going to school and then the teachers are working in that environment. It just is, it's really um, tragic. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming without data backing it up that if a woman lives in a home where there is a gun, then she is most likely the victim of that gun. Is that true? Great question. Don't actually totally know. Um, but based on the um, data around the relative prevalence of different types of gun deaths, it's actually suicide is the most common cause of gun death, not intimate partner homicide, um, or it's the most common mechanism of gun death. So I don't know that that assumption would actually be true because my guess, based on the data that Art Kellerman created in the early 90s, one would suggest that suicide is more common. So one more question, are there any studies of the effect of fear of potential gun violence on student mental health? There's that scoping review that um, I did and I can try to find it and send it to Camille afterwards. I forget the exact year that looks at some of this, but there are no really, there, there are a couple of preliminary studies. There are no great ones out there. Well, thank you so much for taking time to answer the questions and for your amazing presentation. And I hope this is the beginning of a conversation and potential collaborations that we have with you and Brown University. And there's obviously clearly a lot of work to be done and we really appreciate you being here today. So thank you so much, Dr. Rani. Well, thank you for the invitation. Thank you all for joining today. And I look forward to staying in touch and seeing the world change thanks to our work. Mm -hmm.